inaugural episode of our new series, Yalla Y'all, conversations with activists working on the front lines for Palestinian and Black liberation. As this is our first conversation of the series, I would like to first explain the purpose of the series, and then I will introduce our guests. The purpose of the Yalla Y'all conversations is to highlight those activists who have been working consistently for the effective and complete liberation of Palestinian and Black people globally. Some of our guests are very well-known activists in the racial justice, justice movements that include Palestinian and Black liberation, but many are not as well-known, but have been working on the front lines for the rights of Black and Palestinian people for decades. Also, as our guests will be sharing their stories as to how they become activists, we wanted to impress upon our audiences that one does not have to be famous or have any special credentials to become an activist. Most people become activists because they see something that is wrong that they want to try to bring awareness to and help correct. In other words, activists are ordinary people who become involved in doing extraordinary things in the name of justice and peace. So you too can become an activist. And with that, I will introduce our first guest. Professor Alex Lubin is a professor of African American Studies at Pennsylvania State University. Uh, professor Lubin's teaching and research are fo focused on transnational histories, including linking African Americans to North Africa and the Middle East. He is the author of Geographies of Liberation, The Making of Afro-Arab Political Imaginary, and the forthcoming book, Never Ending War on Terror. So thank you, uh, Professor. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you and to um, have this discussion with you. Um, one of the reasons why we thought this would be, you would be a, a good person to have on for our, as our first guest is because as you were aware in the incident that happened with the murder of George Floyd this summer, um, the incident began in a corner store in Minnesota uh, that was owned and operated by an Arab American person. And although he uh, did not call the police initially, um, after he found out what had happened, um, he felt the need to make a statement, to condemn the murder, and to, to I think, to bring some solace um, to the communities that he serves. And so, you know, one of the things that uh, we know within uh, the relationships between Black and Arab and Arab American people is that there is a tension. And so, but yet there are commonalities of our struggle for justice in the United States and abroad. And so your book, uh, Geographies of Liberation, the Making of Afro-Arab Political Image Imaginary, provides a wonderful con con contextual landscape for why these tensions exist among the Black community and the Arab American or Palestinian American community. And so I wanted you to kind of expound upon that and to, to, to discuss the premise of your book. And as you are, um, you know, your research is about the transnational histories between um, Afro-American people in, you know, in North America and, and North Africa, um, could you kind of explain that as well? Sure. First of all, I want to thank you for having me on this show. I'm honored to be uh, an interview subject. <clears throat> the question that you ask raises lots of issues that I think are related. First, it's important to note that <clears throat> while there is a flourishing of solidarity between African American and particularly um, Arab people involved in the, the struggle for Palestine, for justice in Palestine, that those moments of solidarity don't also erase the fact that there are and have been historical tensions between all communities and these two communities as well. So there is obviously a history of Arab Americans who have in, in struggling to be included in the United States, have at times in, wanted to disassociate themselves from Black communities. There have similarly been times when Black Americans have articulated um, U.S. imperial policies and Orientalist stereotypes about the Arab world. Um, and my book 
Geographies of Liberation outlines some of those tensions, but then also demonstrates that there have been also moments of overlap and conjuncture where these communities also see themselves as having shared fates. So for example, although this is not something I write about in my book, um, there is even in places like Michigan where there have sometimes been tensions between Arab Americans and African American communities. There've also been moments of solidarity around labor issues. Mm -hmm. Like when the, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers um, formed solidarity with Arab American workers on the shop floor, but also moments of transnational solidarity when African Americans in the United States, particularly during the era of anti-imperialism um, and uh, particularly the Black Power movement, saw connections with anti-imperialist movements of brown peoples around the world, across Latin America, across Asia, but also in the Middle East. And so groups like the Black Panther Party, for example, saw common cause with the Palestinian Liberation Organization. So the, the question then for me as a scholar is to think about when and where moments of solidarity take place and when and where they don't, and to ask what historical forces, what social forces are creating either moments of discord or solidarity. Thank you. And, and I, I, I want to put a pin on the uh, relationship between the Black Panther uh, movement and the, the uh, Black Power movement and, and the solidarity work that they had. But I want to kind of go back. Um, one of the things that struck me in reading um, the introduction of your book is that um, there was a passage where you talked about contrapuntal identities. And the passage said Contrapunt contrapuntal identities are produced in the collusion of the exiles competing national attachments between home and homelessness. Um, as Edward Said recognized the contradiction of the exiles belongings produced a different sort of consciousness, a second sight. Contrapuntalism names the consciousness of being national and between national inclusion and exile. And so I wanted to kind of, for you to kind of explain that because the part that that struck me was the issue of having a home but he, being homeless at the same time. And I, I've had this conversation with my father and other people um, in terms of how uh, Black Americans and African Americans tend to look at ourselves in terms of how our, our lived experience has been in the United States. Um, you know, throughout the civil rights movement, we have been told to go back to Africa or even before that, you know, there were times throughout history where, um, you know, we were being, we were shipped to Africa at times, back to Africa after we came here. But then, you know, there has been this, this, this sentiment in the United States that we should go back to Africa. And even in terms of uh, President Obama's presidency, the fact that um, Donald Trump um, used the birtherism to kind of delegitimize him um, as an American citizen, um, you know, has brought up this sense that Black Americans are Americans, but America is not truly our home and we have not been welcomed here. And I feel the same kind of connection and relationship with Palestinians in Palestine, where um, you know, after 1948, they were displaced out of their homeland. And while they still live there, they are on occupied land right now. And it's not truly their home and they're seeking to um, return. So could you kind of expound on that and kind of, you know, explain this, this notion of compunctual identities? Mm -hmm. So the, the concept of contrapuntalism um, was articulated most clearly by the great Palestinian intellectual Edward Said, mm -hmm. who more than anybody helps birth the intellectual movement called post-structuralism. But most important for our discussion today was also a scholar keenly interested in what it meant to be an exile and what kind of politics were possible from exile. And Said taking the Palestinian subject as, as an example, 
um, was interested in the kinds of consciousness that came from, as you said, being ripped apart from your home and being at, and yet still being attached to it intellectually and consciously and, and, and wanting to return. And what happens in that space where you can't go back, but you're forced away? And Said argued that that was a kind of consciousness that was exilic and exile consciousness, but he understood it through a metaphor based in music, which was contrapuntalism, which was that, you know, he was, he was someone who was really um, a fan and aficionado of classical music. And there's a, there's a function within music where when two discordant sounds come together, they produce something new. Right. Mm -hmm. They seem to be discordant. They seem not to be able to fit together. But when they collide, they create something new and often wonderful. And that that's sort of the contrapuntal space between longing for home, but being forced away from it, being ripped apart from it. And Saeed knew that exile was not a romantic identity. It's not that contrapuntal identities are um, things that we seek because they're also rooted in the pain of not being able to go back to one's home. I use the concept in, in my book, um, I, I borrow Saeed's concept to think about how, as you mentioned, Black Americans and to some extent Jewish Americans and Jews globally have experienced similar kinds of exilic politics as part of their consciousness, part of their political consciousness. And so, Part of my project in that in that book, Geographies of Liberation, is to think about at what moment have the politics of exile overlapped with different kinds of community. Now, in that book, I focus on, sure, the ways in which Black Americans have overlapped with Palestinians in their recognition of exilic politics. But I also focus on the fact that for most of US history, African American communities also identified with the Jewish narrative of exile and return as well. And so there's also a politics of black Zionism that informed a lot of the black Christian church um, that also, at least up until the 1950s, um, shaped African American engagement with the Arab Israeli question. Um, all of that is rooted in a kind of exilic politics and a sense of being uh, ripped away from a homeland, um, and and but it's expressed itself in different ways given different historical moments. In the context of Black studies, I think the concept of exile is one that um, has been productively thought of in terms of Said's notion of contrapuntalism, in the sense that, as you point out, Black study is essentially the study of what it feels like the distance between being kicked out of or excluded from a place or debased, but also the sense of wholeness and an identity that emerges from someplace else that doesn't come necessarily from acceptance or being home, but comes from being somewhere in between. And I think that that's similar to the condition for, for many Palestinians as well. Well, thank you for that, it's that explanation. Um, I think that really explains um, the connections that I think, um, I mean, immigrant people in general have with um, the African-American experience, but also the connections that, um, uh, you know, Black Americans may have with Palestinian Americans. Um, and one of the things that I also wanted to, to talk about is um, the sort of the connections around religion. I don't know if you get in, in, uh, in depth in that in your book around that, but you know, one of the things that we know that we have difficulty with in terms of or our organizing between the black community and the Palestinian community especially is this whole um, idea that the, the land that the Palestinians are on was the land of the chosen people of Israel. And for many Black Americans, because of our religious upbringing and um, our historical context to the Bible, 
Um, that is something sacred to us. And um, we just finished our 13th annual con uh, AMP convention and I hosted um, a, a session on uh, Palestinian and black liberation um, activism. And this was brought up in terms of, you know, our difficulty in being able to um, to coalesce or or change the minds of the Congressional Black Caucus, for example, in terms of their support for APAC and, and their support for Israel in general. So I, I wanted to know if you had any thoughts about that from a historical context or some of the research that you've done. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I was <clears throat> talking about in my previous response, which is that up until the 1950s, <clears throat> when African-Americans thought about Israel, Palestine, they thought about it in terms of the Holy Land, and in particular about biblical narratives of Exodus, um, which is why I think that Christian Zionist politics have been so firmly embraced within many Black churches, historically, and to some extent in the present. So the first African Americans who traveled to the Middle East or to Israel-Palestine um, after emancipation went on religious pilgrimages and they went to reenact certain biblical narratives of Exodus. Um, the first African Americans who participated <clears throat> in Liberian colonization movements mm -hmm. did so believing that they were like Israelites returning to their natal homeland and making the desert bloom. Um, figures ranging from Martin Luther King Jr. to A. Philip Randolph, even to Paul Robeson, believed that Israel was, the creation of the state of Israel was not only a, a just thing to create in the wake of the Holocaust, but that it was also something that was deserved or at least um, prophesized in, in the Bible. Not so much Paul Robeson, but definitely Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and so, you know, alongside that, though, was a recognition of the dispossession of Palestinians that some African-American activists and intellectuals saw clearly, um, but others did not. Now, you asked about religion. Um, religion plays an extremely important role, not only Christian Zionism, but also the politics of Islam within Black communities in the United States. And as I'm sure you know, one of the most important figures in linking Black struggle to the question of Palestine was Malcolm X, mm -hmm. who found himself in Cairo in 1964 largely to study Orthodox Islam at Al-Azhar University, um, but also to engage with not only pan-Islamist, but also pan-Arab politics. And in 1964, Malcolm X, while he was in Cairo, traveled to Gaza, which was under Egyptian control at the time. He met at the Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo with the founders of the, the newly formed Palestinian Liberation Organization. And he believed in justice for Palestinians. He early on saw that the creation of the state of Israel would dispossess Palestinian people. And he saw the state of Israel as a proxy in the Middle East for US imperialism. He saw that connection not only because he was keen, he was a keen observer of US empire and the politics of, of whiteness, but he also saw it because he'd been linked up with Muslim intellectuals and activists across North Africa and the Middle East who educated him about the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Hmm. So on the one hand, religion could be something that allied African-Americans with the state of Israel, with the story of Exodus, with the story of um, the, the refugees returning home, at least in a Christian Zionist story. But religion also was the means through which Malcolm X, the Nation of Islam, and then countless other African-American Muslims saw themselves connected to Muslims in the Arab world. Hmm. 
That's interesting because um, we've just kind of had, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but um, there was a, uh, there's a, a, a man by the name, um, a comedian by the name of Nick Cannon, who just kind of got in a kerfuffle with um, his, uh, he's the producer of a show called Wild and Out on MTV. And he got into a kerfuffle with his, um, uh, the producers of the show because on his podcast, um, I understand uh, what I, from what I understand, his father um, has some ties to the uh, uh, Hebrew Israelites in, in Israel. And so I think Nick has also kind of um, gotten connected with that. And he made some disparaging comments um, that were, taken to be um, uh, anti-Semitic and he lost his show. And so, you know, we're seeing these kinds of things um, even now in terms of how that, that, that very um, fine line that we walk in terms of talking about, um, you know, it's almost like, you know, you can't really talk about Israel in terms of that because that is sacred land. And for most African Americans, it is, um, you know, the land of the chosen people, which we, which is to be known, the land of the Jew, the Jewish homeland. Um, and so, it's interesting that you know, even now, these things are are coming up and 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 being somewhat problematic um, for for us in terms of our relationship with um, Palestinians, but also the relationship with trying to from a political standpoint, trying to um, um, get people to understand and disconnect religion from the political uh, things that the, the, the government of Israel is doing and our, com our complicity, the United States complicity with that. So, mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, I have to say, I, I, I don't know the Nick Cannon example, but one of, one of the things that you mentioned that, that I'm reminded of is that the U.S. State Department is currently embracing a definition of anti-Semitism that links any criticism of the state of Israel as anti-Semitic. And that's a clear-cut example, or a clear-cut effort, I should say, to try to limit what is possible in our critiques of the state of Israel. Now, don't get me wrong, there are cases of anti-Semitism that need to be confronted. One only needs to look at the Unite the Right rally mm -hmm. or when President Trump claims that that my allegiance should be as a Jew should be to Israel more than the United States. That's anti-Semitism as far as I'm concerned. But my criticism of the state of Israel is not anti-Semitic. I criticize Israel because it's a racist settler colonial state, not because it's the state of the Jewish people. Absolutely. And that is one of the things that we as activists who have been working on the issue of Palestine have been trying. That is our mantra that it's not um, it is not anti-Semitic nor racist to talk about um, Israel in terms of the treatment that it has made it out to the Palestinians and that the uh, complicity that the United States has has in terms of uh, aiding and abetting Israel in its in its crimes and 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 apartheid system um, needs to be stopped and and we should not be using our uh, tax U.S. tax dollars for that. So mm -hmm. I want to go back to um, what we were talking about in terms of the uh, Black Power movement and kind of roll it back to um, what we've been uh, experiencing over the last really over the last four years with the development of the uh, movement for Black Lives that pretty much began with the murder of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and actually one of our guests who was on um, our Black Liberation Session um, show the other night, Sandra Tamari, was one of the lead organizers for what was called uh, Ferguson October back in 2014. And I, I went on that, um, that kind of, uh, there was a, a delegation of people who went to Ferguson um, to show solidarity. And so I want to kind of give the connection that, you know, because 
um, part of this show is to show, part of the series is to uh, help people understand that the activism that has been happening is a continuum and that uh, Black and, and Palestinian or Black and Arab American um, uh, activism did not start with, with Ferguson, but it is a continuum of, of things. And so you mentioned the work um, that was done with the, uh, within the Black Power Movement. And as a matter of fact, I remember seeing some documents from, there was a, a, a conference that was held in Gary, Indiana in 1972 that sort of brought all of Black America together to talk about how we would move forward in this new era of affirmative action and all of that. And um, I remember seeing a document, a copy of a document that had so what was similar to what the Movement for Black Lives did in their um, platform back in 2016 um, to include, um, you know, uh, work against the, uh, the occupation of, of the Palestinians. Um, so could you kind of expound upon what you, your research, what you've researched and, and talk about that history? Yeah, so around that time that you're talking about in the early 1970s, the civil rights movement was really fraying into two or many different different strands. You had black feminist politics in the US that were also internationalist and black power politics that had been emerging through the 60s were also moving in different directions from say the NAACP and CORE and other mainstream organizations. And the question of Palestine actually became one of the breaking points when SNCC published in their newsletter something called the Third World Roundup. And in that Third World Roundup, they mentioned the liberation of Palestine as an important pillar um, of their politics. Um, and the Third World Roundup got SNCC kicked out, essentially, of the family of the mainstream civil rights movement at that time. Um, it was seen as too radical. It was accused of being anti-Semitic. Um, some of the artwork that was in the magazine was questionable, Stars of David and Jews with, with um, certain features that look stereotypical. Um, but the politics were clear and that politics was carrying forward the work of Malcolm X um, and others who began to argue that um, Black Americans needed to ally themselves with anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist movements globally. And when the Black Panther Party was formed, it early on took on the politics of Palestine solidarity. And within the Black Panther newspaper, news about Palestine written by um, journalists uh, in Palestine, Palestinian journalists who are affiliated with the PLO or the PFLP began writing articles in the Black Panther newspaper throughout the 1970s. And that culminated in a kind of solidarity um, where the Black Panthers saw what was happening to the Palestinians as similar to what was happening to them in the United States. They argued that the, the enemy was um, US imperialism that US imperialism had created a black colony within the United States that was oppressed, much like the colonies in Africa and that had been colonized by, by Europeans. Um, and that kind of transnational linking created a powerful movement where it became more common for African-Americans, uh, African-American politicians to see Palestinian liberation um, as part of their politics. And that was carried forward in the 1980s by people like June Jordan, the poet, who began writing in the Progressive magazine about the Israeli occupation in Lebanon and the bombardment. Um, in the 1980s, June Jordan linked what happened to Rodney King in Los Angeles to what was happening to the Palestinians in southern Lebanon under Israeli bombardments. Now, in the 1990s and 2000s, the linkages remain, they carry forward from the era of black anti-imperialism, um, those politics from the 1970s. But I would also say that they were transformed a bit. 
Um, one of the things that happened after September 11th, 2001, as the U.S. embarked in these um, unfortunate and violent wars across the Middle East, is that the United States began to understand itself as fighting a war against terror against the Muslim world, similar to what Israel was doing, not just with Palestinians, but in the region. And so one of the things that, that we saw after 9-11 was that U.S. police forces mm. um, began, first of all, receiving military hardware that was left over from the war on terror. We began seeing the U.S. military training in the West Bank, in Palestine, on how to do house-to-house -house searches and combat in dense urban areas. So, for example, I was in Jenin during the early years of the Iraq War, mm -hmm. and there were U.S. forces there training before they went to Iraq. So these Israel became something of a mentor to the U.S. military. And over time, they also became a mentor to U.S. police forces. The New York Police Department opened an office in Tel Aviv, and several U.S. police departments sent their officers to Israel through exchange programs that allowed them to learn how to do things like house-to-house -house searches in dense urban environments, how to basically occupy an area. Because increasingly, um, protest in the United States was understood as a kind of insurgency, similar to the insurgency that was taking place in Middle Eastern battlefields in Afghanistan and Iraq. Fast forward to Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Now, the Ferguson Police Department um, as you well know, came at protesters with military-grade hardware, with military-grade rifles, and with training that they had received as well. At their time, the Ferguson Police Department had trained in Israel through these joint training facilities. And looking at the battlefield in Palestine or in Iraq, um, it was hard to distinguish between the battlefield in Ferguson, Missouri. And so early on, as Black Lives Matter was forming, as people were protesting in the streets, the, the murder of Mike Brown, um, it increasingly became clear that the United States appeared to be something like occupied territory and that the police was acting like a military invading foreign territory. Um, so some of the first statements that came to protesters in Ferguson about how to, for example, to avoid the pain of tear gas came from Palestinians who said, we know what it's like to face U.S. manufactured tear gas, right? So they talked about how not to wash your eyes out, how to protect your eyes. Some of those statements of solidarity early on came from, from Palestinians. So to answer, this is a long-winded way to answer your question, which is to say that, yeah, it's a continuation of Black power politics from an earlier generation, but it's shaped in a new context, which is the global war on terror and global militarized policing, which increasingly makes Black urban areas seem like occupied territory and make Black people into insurgents in just another battlefield in the global war on terror. So I think it's a little bit of a different context, even though it's a it's a continuation of an older politics. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that continuation of that politics even now with the murder of Breonna Taylor um, that happened where uh, there was a no knock warrant um, that uh, the police in Louisville, Kentucky did and, and went into her house and all of that. So yes, you're right there. It is a continuation is a different context, but um, the struggle continues. Um, looking forward, um, what do you see as some of the maybe historical takeaways in terms of what um, Black and Palestinian liber uh, liberation solidarity work may look like? Um, and particularly as we're entering what many of us are calling the Obama administration 1.5 or 2.0 with uh, the election of of Biden and and Senator and and Kamala Harris. Um, what do you see in terms of 
the politics the, you know, historically? Um, what do you see in terms of how, is there anything that you see that we may take away from or, or, or look at or be mindful of as we go forward into this new chapter of, of organizing for Black and Palestin uh, Palestinian liberation? Well, one thing, first of all, let me just say, as an academic, I'm much better at looking at the past than I am at predicting the future. Um, so, so you have as much um, insight on the future as I do. But one of the things that you said earlier about your present activism is something that resonated with me, which is the difficulty in getting the Congressional Black Caucus, for example, to recognize any kind of solidarity with Palestinians. Now, there are some exceptions to that. Um, I am living in Pennsylvania, but I grew up in the Bay Area and Barbara Lee, yes. uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee has been, I think, an exceptional uh, mm -hmm. voice. Um, maybe I wish she'd say more, but um, but she's been out, she has stuck her neck out in yeah. the question of Palestine. But I think to get back to the question, it's, it was striking to me during the election how with all of the contrast between Democrats and Republicans over domestic issues, there has been relative consensus about international issues, and particularly um, with the question of the US-Israel, what is currently being regarded as the special bond. I do not see the Biden-Harris administration changing course in any substantive way, except perhaps being more kind in their language about Palestinians, if not their policies. So let me explain what I mean by that. Much of the Trump administration policies with regard to, let's say, the Muslim ban, or even how it regarded the so-called, and I put this in air quotes, the peace plan with Palestinians, was a continuation of older policies. I mean, let's be honest, it was during the Obama administration that special registration of Muslims traveling began to take place. And although the, the, the travel ban is a particularly draconian version of that special uh, registration, you know, it's not so different from uh, the Obama plan or the Obama policy. Um, it's different, but not so much. Uh, the drone program across the Middle East has not changed that dramatically between the Obama, Trump, and now I suspect Biden administrations. So I think there's going to be much more continuation than there has been divergence. It would be done with a much more compassionate and nicer and softer tone. And I don't think that um, the Biden-Harris administration will want to be quite as racist in their anti-Muslim and Islamophobic rhetoric. But I'm not convinced that the policies are gonna be markedly different. And I fear that what that means um, for Palestinians is more of the same. Um, I hope I'm wrong about that. Now, I do see possibilities for transformative policies or politics, some of them at least, within the United States with regard to structural racism. Um, and that's not going to change bonds between Black Americans and Palestinians, I would think, but it may it may address certain things, um, certain forms of systemic racism within the United States. Um, so the, the short answer is that I think that we'll see changes domestically. I don't know what kind of changes we'll see in the shape of U.S. empire abroad. I think your assessment is is correct. Um, I think most of us who are on the ground are thinking the same thing that um, it won't be as uh, as the uh, as you mentioned, you know, the racism that the Trump administration espoused won't be will probably won't be there in the way that it's been there, the acerbic and you know just the the blatantness of it but it's not going to change um, anything in terms of, of our relationship with Israel and Palestine. As a matter of fact, Kamala Harris has come out pretty strong on, on uh, being a friend to Israel and, and continuing um, the relationship that um, had previous presidents have continued. So I think you're, you're, you're spot on with that assessment.
Well, I think as we're rounding out um, this conversation, it's it's been very rich, and I think um, as a as an inaugural um, uh, show uh, to the series, um, I I'm pleased that you know we've been able to talk about the historical um, uh, the history of of <laughs> organizing that has happened between the Black community and the Palestinian community because I think that sets up the sets us up for our other uh, activists who will be talking more in terms of their own personal experiences. But as we end, do you have any um, any parting thoughts that you'd like to share? Well, first of all, again, I'm honored to be included in the series um, and to, to talk with you. I think that, um, I guess one of the things that I'd like to conclude with is by thinking about what activism is. And some of, sometimes, um, as activists, we are in marches, we're making flyers, we are carrying signs or posters. And I've done some of that in my life. Um, I've taken students to the West Bank um, to teach them about Palestine. But I think one aspect of activism that's always been important to me is to think critically and to engage in scholarship that gives voice to submerged voices, to people who don't get to represent themselves sometimes, or who don't have the privilege of, of representing themselves or writing a book. So one of the things that I like to do in my scholarship is to think about what stories don't get to be told because they don't have the privilege of speaking in the way that I do. Um, and so I think all the time about how my activism or how my academic work can also be engaged in an activist project, not only through educating the public or educating my students, but also in using my research to give voice to people who may not have easy access to voice right now. Well, thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate all of the uh, thoughtfulness and, and the thoroughness that you gave in terms of of talking about the history of, of Black and Palestinian liberation um, connections. And so I want to thank everyone for being, for watching this. And uh, please stay tuned for the next series, uh, the next show of the, in this series. series. Um, and um, thank you so much, Professor Lubin. And I want to bid you a good day. Thank you. Have a good day yourself.